Now, if you have been a long-time subscriber or just viewer of the channel, you'd know that there are a lot of misconceptions about the samurai, and in particular, the Sengoku period. There are many of these false ideas that I've been trying to cover in a lot of my videos, from more focused topics like weapons and behaviors to larger concepts like that of Bushido. And of course, there are always more to come. In fact, next month I'll be taking part in another large collaboration across many history channels of different historical topics to cover more myths and misconceptions, with a very large one that I'm excited to finally dive into. That is actually what my recent and planned community post was alluding to. But as you have no doubt seen as well, I'm also part of another series of monthly collaborations, alongside channels Samurai and Ninja History, Sengoku Studies, and also a great channel called Samurai Traditions of the Tara Genji. And as it just so happens, Misconceptions is also the topic we decided to cover this month in our monthly Samurai History collaboration series as well. So I've had to diversify a bit with my topics in order to not retread too similar of ground two months in a row. This month, though, I have decided to make a brief list diving into five of the most common spread myths and misconceptions about specifically the Sengoku Jidai, Japan's iconic and transformative age of warring states. There are obviously tons of misconceptions that have been spread about this period through movies, shows, games, and even books, some of which I'm even a little bit guilty of treading into on occasion throughout my own series. However, the five that I have chosen to highlight here today are I think some of the biggest, just specifically for the period, and ones that I've at least tried to some degree avoid or at least be honest about in the past. And just to be clear, I'll be presenting these in no particular order. If you want to learn more about other samurai misconceptions, don't forget to check out the other videos by Samurai and Ninja History, Sengoku Studies, and Samurai Traditions of the Tada Genji. Links to all of their videos will be down below. But with that said, let's jump into our first great myth or misconception about the Sengoku period. This being one you will probably have seen a lot of if you play samurai games. This is the idea that all of the daimyo, samurai warlords, during this period were all out there trying to become strong enough to march on Kyoto and claim the coveted title of Shogun. You see this in Total War Shogun 2, the Samurai Warriors Empires games, and of course the Nobunaga's Ambition series, among many others. This goal of becoming Shogun and ruling all of Japan and the Samurai class works in these games as a great objective for you to strive towards as the player. But in reality, it was untrue that all of the daimyo were so ambitious. In fact, more daimyo would try to puppet the shogunate than even try to take the title for themselves. The truth of the matter is that the weak authority of the Ashikaga shogunate allowed many powerful daimyo to emerge as autonomous rulers of their domains, and many lesser lords to even rise up to assert their own independence. This of course would lead to many lords taking advantage of the weak government to expand their own territory and influence. Many of them just wanted to become mighty regional powers and had no real lust to seize the capital and become the new shogun. Two prime examples of this are the Mori and the Gohojo or later Hojo. Both of these were mighty clans who rose to prominence during the chaos of the Sengoku period. And although they grew to command large and mighty domains, we can also see how they did not really ever try to make a dedicated push to seize the capital and claim the title of Shogun. They were content in their areas of regional influence. Of course, they also had plenty of rivals that they were bordering with as well, which would have made it difficult to attempt such a course of action. But still, it does not even appear that it was ever really considered by them or many others. And like I said, there would also be those who were simply more interested in exploiting and puppeting the shogunate itself while it was still around at least. From the Hosokawa, to the Miyoshi, to later the Oda, who would finally dismantle it. Toyotomi Hideyoshi would even continue to rule as the Taiko without any shogunate over him. It would not be until the rise of Tokugawa Ieyasu that the title of shogun would again be restored. But as you can see, claiming the title itself was not the main goal for so many, and the idea that it was the major objective that all daimyo wanted to achieve is flat out incorrect. Number two on our list comes to actually how the maps of Japan are usually presented today. This isn't really restricted to just the Sengoku period, but 
Normally when you do see a territorial map of the Sengoku period, be it of a clan or group of clans, much like the ones I have made for my own series or other ones that you can find in books, documentaries, and of course games, they tend to often look like this, usually showing provinces under the sole ownership of one clan. And although this is fantastic for simplicity and giving people a broad understanding of who commanded the majority of influence in these provinces, it is not exactly accurate to how realistic maps of Japan would be. I think a great example to use would be the maps made by this Twitter user, at Francisco1530, who has gone through the painstaking work of creating many maps that do accurately represent the territorial ownership of the provinces. As you can see, they look almost like Jackson Pollock paintings, illustrating that while powerful daimyo did in fact rule majorities of areas, much of the remaining land was heavily divided by all other minor landholding families throughout the country. Obviously though, it is quite understandable why we don't often see maps like this at all. Firstly is the simple fact they would just be too confusing for many people. And secondly is regarding making the maps, because finding all the correct info on where each minor family was is a long process that requires the person making the map to be able to read Japanese sources that explain where each family was, as well as requiring you the reader to also probably know Japanese because that's what all the labels would likely be in. This is why so many instead opt for the simpler approach of just showing who was the most powerful lord ruling over each province. So no, maps like this are not perfect, but it is quite understandable why they are used so often, and probably the most understandable misconception of this entire list. Moving on to number 3, we have what weapons were actually used. Once again, if you have been with the channel for a long time, you probably have heard me talk quite a bit about this topic. The most iconic weapon of the samurai is no doubt their swords, from the tachi to the katana and so on. And I mean, who can blame anyone for always trying to highlight them? Japanese swords look really cool, not to mention how much they actually meant symbolically to the samurai who carried and wielded them. However, the idea that swords were the main melee weapon used in samurai battles is completely false. The main melee weapon used by soldiers throughout the Sengoku period actually was the Yari Spear, which brings up another misconception as well about polearms. So often we see the Naginata depicted, not only in plenty of works of art, but also games. In Shogun 2, the Naginata unit is even one you have to unlock after the Yari, which does not make much sense. In reality, the Naginata was mostly getting phased out throughout the Sengoku Jidai, as the Yari, a much more versatile weapon, took over. Although it does still appear that the Naginata still held popularity among warrior monks. Personally, I am inclined to believe that the reason why the Naginata is depicted more is simply because it looks more unique or perhaps cool than the Yari, which can sometimes just come off looking like a simple spear. But the last major Sengoku Jidai weapon that I do want to highlight quickly is luckily one that people are starting to realize the truth about, that being matchlock firearms. So often we see the popular image of the bow-wielding samurai, and it was one that was certainly truthful. Well, up until 1543. It was in that year that Europeans first arrived in Japan, bringing with them, among many other things, western-style firearms. They would soon catch on as a significant tool of warfare in Japan, as many began to spread throughout the country, initially through trade with the west, but soon enough through local production as well. Now that's not to say that the usage of the bow completely disappeared. The bow would still be used throughout the rest of the period as well, but it would not be wrong to say that the gun began to overtake it. Firearms would see their ultimate peak in usage in the final four decades of the period, as the Japanese began to really innovate in terms of their usage, implementing them to devastating effect. Indeed, by the Siege of Osaka, rising hostilities could even be simply tracked through the rising sale of gunpowder as the market continued to shoot higher and higher. Yet because they did not really hit their stride until the later decades of the period, it's hard to say that they were the main ranged weapon of the period, but they certainly left a mighty impact on its legacy. However, let's move on to our fourth major misconception. Now that we have talked about weapons, let's now turn to talk about castles. Like a lot of other elements of the samurai and pre-modern Japan, samurai castles are too one of the most iconic images that are often depicted whenever we think of them. And it's true that samurai castles really hit their stride during the Sengoku period, as new magnificent structures would be created. 
The appearance of samurai castles stand out as really more unique than most other forms of fortifications throughout history, as large sloped stone walls flatten off to reveal tall and mighty tenchu or towers at the top. There is a ton of detail that goes into the design of the various styles of samurai castles, and although we can immediately picture them in our heads, it is interesting to discover the iconic way they look actually arose late in the period as well. That is not to say that samurai castles were unrecognizable before this point either though, it's rather that the design of them often used to rely more heavily on natural terrain, most commonly placing towers and fortifications up at the top of a mountain or hill. This concept had remained somewhat consistent throughout much of samurai history, at least until the 1570s with the rise of Oda Nobunaga. Nobunaga would pioneer a new castle design, with the magnificent castle he would construct by 1579 known as Azuchi. Azuchi was not only an architectural wonder, incorporating more stone than normal fortifications and implementing one of the tallest structures for its time, but also it sat at an extremely important position where the roads came from the east going towards the capital. This made Azuchi a significant power base, not just for military purposes, but also for political and cultural ones as well. Sadly, Azuchi would be destroyed shortly after Nobunaga died during the Honoji incident in 1582. But many of the most significant castles that would follow all take their lead from Azuchi, as they truly became the modern design of samurai castles that we have come to know today. Now, if you have not gathered it already, the Sengoku period was an age of great change, not just militarily, but also politically, culturally, and perhaps most importantly, societal. And this is what the final misconception I want to talk about is. So often we think about or hear about the Sengoku period being simply an age of endless violence and warfare between all of the mighty daimyo, but obviously it was quite more than just that. In reality, it was an age of great social change and evolution that was brought about by the weak central government and the violence it created. One could argue that the Sengoku period did as much to change the lives of everyday commoners as it would to change the face of the samurai warrior class itself. But there would be no greater symbols of reform than that of the Three Great Unifiers, who can not only be called such for their actions in restoring peace to the nation through conquest, but also by bringing the country back together under strong and stable new systems of governance. Through their initiative, the lives of common people would be set in stone, as social mobility would in time be restricted and elements of the lower classes barred from traveling between domains without authorization, not to mention the fact that they would also all be stripped of weapons they owned. The samurai too would see themselves heavily restricted more and more as well, as their duties became more defined and their role would eventually turn into that of bureaucrats as the Edo period came about. In fact, to see the truest example of just how far the country would go in terms of the change that would come, one only needs to look at the rise of the Edo period and how it differed to the regimes that came before, not only in its structure, but also how the country as a whole was to be governed. So basically, while so often we think of the Sengoku period as being this large and iconic age of warfare with each of the daimyo trying to come out on top to rule the land, the real conclusion of the period was one driven not necessarily to conquer, but to change and reform, fixing the flawed and failed systems of the past to create a new and a mighty state to stand the test of time. Now of course I could go deeper into all five of these myths and misconceptions. Each of these could deserve their own full video. In fact, I have made full videos on some of these already. But what I hope I accomplished was at least shedding some light on the larger misconceptions we have about this extremely iconic period. Once again, there is another big Samurai misconception video that I'll be working on soon as well, so keep an eye out for that. And also, if you want to learn more about other Samurai misconceptions, I will leave links down below to videos from all the other great channels who are putting out misconception videos of their own. With that said, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.